Hey, everybody, we've got an amazing show for you today. It's all news. It's Monday. There's a lot going on, including Pete Davidson, uh, who seems to be at the top of everybody's trending topics three days a week, is going to space. A incredibly shrewd marketing move by Jeff Bezos. Uh, and Chad is going to space. What else do we got on the docket, Mom? Okay. We literally thought we could avoid the Pete Davidson news, but yes. he came for us even here Absolutely. in the world of technology. Um, update on the technology industry and what it's doing in the war. Clearview AI is apparently offering its facial recognition services to the Ukrainian government. We have a skepticism filled conversation about that. Yeah, is that a good idea or not? Here's a great idea. The New York Times just launched a telegram channel where they're publishing so that people maybe in authoritarian countries might get access to their coverage of what's happening in Ukraine. And uh, what a great idea uh, to get yeah. that channel. Good innovation. And then semiconductor slowdowns keep impacting automakers and they are getting worse because of shutdowns uh, over COVID in China. Ford is actually shipping their explorers now without rear air conditioning controls. Why go on? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, no rear air conditioning controls. You have to ask the driver to change the temperature. Oh, my Lord. It's like the olden days. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what next? <laughs> what to do what anyway, to do but it's, it's, but it's a big deal it's a big economic story we do have issues with the supply chain and the uh, sadly it looks like outbreaks in Shenzhen uh, of uh, COVID that could again create the never ending supply chain issues that have been dogging the world for the last two plus years it's going to be a great show nonetheless stick with us this week in startups is brought to you by lemon.io Need to speed up your product development without draining your budget? Hire vetted engineers from Europe at Lemon.io. Go to Lemon.io slash twist to get 15% off for the first four weeks. Boast. If you're a startup developing new software or R&D, you may be owed up to $250,000 in cash back from the government. Boast helps you get that money quickly and easily. The first 50 customers will get 10% off their first year by mentioning promo code TWIST at boast.ai slash twist. And our crowd helps you invest early in pre-IPO companies alongside professional VCs. If you're interested in investing, you can join our crowd for free at OURCROWD.com slash twist. So space tourism just continues to get bigger and bigger and more mm. celebrity driven yes. because this, by God, is America. The latest announcement is that Blue Origin has chosen Wait Saturday Night Live's most effective attention getter in history, yes. Pete Davidson, to go on its next New Shepard flight on March 23rd. It's fascinating. I mean, I think... You got to give Bezos a lot of credit because he puts a celebrity on each one of these. I think he was on the first. Yep. He had William, William Shatner, Shatner on one. Mm -hmm. uh, now he's got Pete Davidson. And this is the fourth flight, I think. So uh, it is. Yeah, it's Blue Origin's 20th mission. But I think the fourth one fourth with commercial flight. Yeah. At least famous people. <laughs> Yeah, I think you counted it. by the number of famous people. Uh, and yeah. he also had the um, famous uh, female um, astronaut. I forgot her he name. He did. Yeah. No, the woman who wanted, who was an aviator who had wanted to be an astronaut and couldn't. They kiboshed And so it. then she got to go. She, you know, I mean, she did became, become a really famous aviator, but then she got to go on the flight. And that was a little, it was a weep worthy. It was a good one. So this uh, will include, let's see, uh, Marty Allen, Pete Davidson, husband and wife duo Sharon and Mark Hagel, hmm. Jim Kitchen and Dr. George Neald. The fourth it, human a bunch flight. of rich people, yeah. right? It's and is it still fifty grand to go, a hundred grand or something? It's I don't know what it costs to go up in this thing, but I feel like when this hits a hundred thousand or less, like basically the the cost of a private jet across the country is like I think thirty forty grand. I've never done it, um, but that's my understanding. So when it gets to kind of that price, uh, I think it's going to become very popular. I think this is going to become like the bucket list item, and I I don't know. Would you would you do this after? You know, they have 100 successful flights. Is this on your bucket list, Molly? I don't know if it's on my bucket list. I wouldn't say that it's not. Mm. Well, I guess that means no, right? If it's not specifically on my list, right. then I guess it's not on my list. But it's not not on my list. I would certainly, I think, take the opportunity. It's like one of those interesting questions, though. You know how, like, you're waiting for the bus and the bus doesn't mm. come for a really long time. And you're then you start to have a sunk cost situation about the bus. Like, well, it's eventually going to come. Anyway, right. I guess what I'm trying to say is 
four times doesn't feel that safe. Mm. But then a hundred times, you're just getting to the point where things are starting to break down. So like, what's the, <laughs> what's yeah. the most comfortable moment? I think it's the opposite. I don't think these things like the break rocket. down. I think they get like, yeah, more they cemented in like, mm-hmm. and they get better and dialed in. So I, for me, it's somewhere I like, it. I would do it after 250 to 500 successful missions. Yeah. And it feels to me like they're going to be doing these weekly. And then you have Virgin has theirs. Um, and the Virgin Galactic one is interesting. I don't have any equity in it, even though my friends backed it. But I, I saw Virgin Galactic ads on Twitter, which I thought was the sign what? that this is now ready for serious commercialization. Wow. What, Reserve they had, now. They had, I think, two or 300 RSVPs. I think they're looking for more RSVPs because this means that they want to fill seats and they expect they're going to have opening soon and they're going to get through those 200 or 400 RSVPs. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. I think it's good. So the chat is talking about like Francis Centaur in our chat's talking about Tokyo in 90 minutes being heaven. Like I sort of wonder at what point could we use this sort of near orbit access and speed to maybe actually take us places on earth faster. That's what I really want. You know, I'm an efficiency minded person. So I'm like, that's mm. kind of cool that I could go into near orbit or whatever and be like a pseudo astronaut and stuff. But like what I really want is something like rocket ship Concorde. Yes, that's what I want as well. I tweeted. It's interesting that you bring this up because that's what I tweeted this weekend when I saw the ad. I was like, for me, the big win is what SpaceX is doing. They're going to do point to point in the world. Um, and I think they can hold 300 people on theirs. <laughs> which is bonkers. I think that'll be five or 10 years out. Yeah. Uh, but that's like truly going to space. And they said one hour or less anywhere on the globe, because the higher you go, the f- the curvature of the earth, I guess, becomes narrower then. So you're not like flying over an arc, you're kind of going straight up and straight down, mm-hmm. right? Because the aperture would be so narrow that, yeah. you know, if you're in Texas, you go straight up some number of you know, distance, and then coming down to, let's say, Tokyo, or Fiji, or Antarctica, I'm thinking like really oh, hard to get to places. See, that would be incredible. Can you imagine being in Antarctica in one hour. I mean, that oh would be gosh. bonkers from Texas. Yeah. And that's like, that's a total, like really interesting um, adventure. And I think that's five to 10 years away, but it's going to be absurdly expensive. Mm-hmm. I think it becomes like this crazy bucket list item for people. I think the reason it's not on people's bucket list items because this generally has not been available. Right, exactly. And yeah. there's a, I mean, I guess bucket list items often include a high risk of death, depending on who you are. And I certainly, certainly you know, I have friends I mean, who just started know. doing, uh, I have friends who just started doing skydiving. You know, these mm-hmm. guys get to 50 and they're like, you know what? I made a bunch of money. <laughs> of What's an play? interesting way for me to, you know, go out. That's kind of pedestrian at this point, skydiving. Like, come on. I mean, it is amazing how how humans tend to think of like more and more incredible ways to die, though. I actually I read there was a piece about William Shackleton, who was the Antarctic explorer. He's that's the ship they just found. Yes, Shackleton. They found his ship. Yeah. And it's in perfect shape. And it's in perfect shape. And then I went and read this like very long read Mm. about that expedition. Yes. The one where the endurance sank. And it yep. is the most bananas survival yeah. story. There yes. were like 50 guys, 55 guys on that ship. They all ended up surviving, but they were split up across the continent, Shackleton, and they were like, they had to eat their sled. Dog. Like, it's pretty insane what people can survive. That was a huge departure uh, from this all is things in, tech. Yeah. But it's a really cool story. Uh, it became frozen. Uh, the reason people are really into Shackleton and the entrepreneurial community is they like to take you know, it's pretty much three metaphors for startups and entrepreneurship, war, team sports, and yeah. then being an adventurer. And, and for good reason, because, you know, most of the companies don't work out, uh, die, uh, if you want to attribute it that way. But uh, yeah, they were they uh, departed South Georgia for the Wendell Sea on December 5th. And uh, they encountered a bunch of ice and uh, they grew worse. And on January 15th, it became frozen in the ice flow and, and so the ice crushed it crushed it and, and then they everybody had to get out of can you imagine you're like in the middle of ice and you got to get out and get on life rafts or whatever oh yeah and they're pulling like life rafts across the ice i mean it's pretty bananas the whole story is bananas and then like they're all they had to take a one of these crappy little lifeboats like 80 miles to get to another island to and then try to like and then like walk across 
you know, this, that huge island. It, it just is like, I don't know. It's, I'm all over the place here, but it's basically like it is the human way to push the envelope just yes. for the sake of pushing. And yeah. I don't, you know, I mean, I think we get a lot out of it over time, but this is what you want to see. This is the want ad. It's so funny. These guys, <laughs> this is good producing guys because I literally yeah, have it bravo, up on my screen bravo. at the same time. So the reason I brought this up before is, uh, you know, I've told a lot of folks when you're doing a startup, you want to be candid with the people you're hiring of <clears throat> exactly what the odds are. And frequently in startup land, we, we reference the famous Shackleton ad where it says men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, <laughs> uh, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Ernest Shackleton for Burlington Street. <laughs> For Burlington Street. It's so great. That's remarkable. <laughs> I, I just love the last line. Honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. It's basically Wally describing Funk. startup land. Thank you, producers, by the way, who also multitasking put in Wally Funk. That's the name of the woman aviator who Wally now gets Funk, to say yes. astronaut Congratulations at 80 to her. Two years old. Yeah, I mean, I have no problem with this industry commercializing to sort of become more and more mainstream and normalize the whole concept. And also, at some point, one of these things is probably going to blow up and somebody famous is going to be on board. And I don't know what that does to the industry. We'll see. Like, they're ready. I am in no way trying to suggest that these companies are not ready to be doing what they're doing. And it's also a pretty dangerous business. So, like, ugh. there will be a uh, yeah, there'll be a moment like that for sure. And yep. the prepare. question is, like self-driving or any new technology, uh, VTOLs will have this moment as well. Can society... Uh, deal with that dissonance yep. new safer new and safer but somebody just died right and, and you know that is and there's actually a seminal case right now of somebody who ran a red light while using autopilot and i think it was like an early version of autopilot like the one that just is like level two keep your car in the lane and go a certain speed mm -hmm. so like who's responsible for that it's like i think we know it's responsible like you know it's it's literally you're doing adaptive cruise control and not looking for red lights on the street well, yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, you know, there there are people who will stand on the top of their motorcycle, like on YouTube. You can see all hundred like, percent people yep. doing crazy stuff. So you have to kind of discount them. Well, it's kind but, of like the American way, though, to blame somebody else and sue them for the thing that you caused. So that's what's so interesting here is like yeah. it's you've got this natural tendency and all this, you know, this sort of like <laughs> ambulance chasing law industry waiting for the opportunity to blame someone else for a thing that happened to you. Yes. So then when it ends up being something really big and explodey, what it will, I mean, I agree, we'll see, right? It's like part of the process of normalizing it is going to kn be knowing that mm. something like this will happen and how will we deal when it does. In related news, Kanye West <laughs> <laughs> is uh, trying to buy one of the five other seats on the... <laughs> exactly. On In related flight. news, Kanye West is going to be like shining a laser at it as it takes off. Like I mean... <laughs> Mental illness plus social medias are such a bad combination. Oh. I mean, I've said it before, but like this, and I don't want to get into like the, the blow by blows, but this weekend was like my entire Twitter feed was an Instagram was Kanye West and Skeet fighting. Mm. Uh, just crazy. Yeah. Um, it's mm. kind of sad to watch people, especially because when it involves parenting, that's like the heartbreaking part. It's like, can somebody who's friends with this individual pull them aside and say like, just stop talking about your kids on social media. This is like, this is like therapy questions, like couples therapy, mediation stuff. Don't put it there. But I, 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 uh, I'm excited to do the transportation one. And then let's see the cost here. Virgin 150k deposit 450k total price. They got 100 tickets sold 15 million wow. sales from deposits. That's like a good start. And then, you know, this is going to quickly go down. So if it's 450, you think of it like getting the first Tesla Roadster was 160, I think. And now they're down to 60. So I would say this goes down by a third in 10 years. So if it goes down by a third, you know, lower, it uh, goes down by two thirds, rather, and it's one third the price, I think you could see people doing this for 100k. Yeah, or less. And I think that's yeah. when it becomes like, people will crowdfund it, or they'll be giving it away on the Z boarding zoo, go to space, <laughs> we're gonna have a space race mm -hmm. brought to you by I mean, it will literally be I think, oh, yeah, uh, there'll be sponsors doing this and all kinds of interesting stuff.
When you're scaling your startup quickly, hiring engineers can slow you down like nothing else. We all know that. Well, here's some good news for you. Lemon.io will find you the perfect candidate within, wait for it, 48 hours, I kid you not. And what is Lemon.io, you ask? They're a marketplace of engineers from Europe, where some of the greatest engineers in the world are based, and they'll match you with a candidate again within just 48 hours. That's two days for those of you doing the math at home. And if it doesn't work out, they're going to replace the developer right away. So there is no risk for you with the founder of a startup. And they test and interview every developer to eliminate the risk of a failed project. So we got a testimonial from Launch Portfolio founder Drew Fabricant, and he told us that Lemon was a game changer for his startup Scout, which is a lead gen platform. They do great stuff. They were under the gun. They needed to hire a developer with a very specific skill set as soon as possible. And Lemon delivered. And they were a pleasure to work with, according to my pal Drew. So not only did they find exactly what they were looking for, but Lemon also delivered them a second engineer really fast. What a great story. So here's your call to action. If you could use a full-time or part-time developer to run your projects faster, I want you to go to lemon.io slash twist. Again, lemon.io slash twist. And you're going to receive a 15% discount for the first four weeks of work with a developer. What a great deal. Okay, let's go on to this the New York Times story, which I thought mm -hmm. was super interesting. The New York Times has launched a Telegram channel. For people who don't know, Telegram is exceptional at groups, it seems. And when a lot of the alt-right was kicked off of Twitter, they started their own groups. So people like Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, who but 15 years ago was like a normal journalist uh, working, I think, at The Guardian or The Times of London, and he kind of went off the uh, alt-right deep end. He got banned from Twitter. I think Alex Jones, Trump, all of them set up shop on Telegram. Um, so you can have like really big groups, but New York Times uh, Brazilian uh, Bureau Chief Jack Nickas, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, said this is important. The New York Times just launched a Telegram channel. And for now, it will broadcast our reporting about the war in Ukraine. It'll hopefully be a powerful new source of free, reliable information for many people. Mm. Um, you can follow it here. Um, for those who don't know, the short URL system for, um, uh, for Telegram, rather, is uh, t.me. So it's t.me slash New York Times. And you just add the group. It also works really well on your desktop. So what's really neat about this is if they wanted to, uh, you could have replies in here, it could be two way they could, you know, you can have all kinds of different permutations of groups as you do on the web. Uh, but this will be a little bit censorship resistant, I think. Uh, and uh, you can also access it through the tour browser, uh, if you don't know what that is, or brave, a tour is a, an anonymous relay system that theoretically can't be tracked, but it might have been made by the FBI. <laughs> and the CIA, they might have actually <laughs> built it so <laughs> take it for what it's worth so hard to say hard to say it's hard to say but they do seem to catch a lot of predators on there and yeah. crazy people so it's interesting though because in many ways the biggest barrier to free and reliable information and say what you will about the new york times but you know they have a lot of boots on the ground in a lot of places is the paywall so I do mm. think that there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of value in this for a lot of reasons. One is that it might be able to be accessed by people in lots of different stories, uh, lots of different countries who might have had trouble mm. accessing it otherwise. But also, if it's not paywalled, mm. I think that I think there's real value. I think there's this real question. And, you know, I think that journalism needs a business model that works. But at the same time, when all when everything that's reliable and high quality is behind a paywall, and yes. everything that is, you know, not is free yes you have a real have and have not situation when it comes to information so i think it's well and what's nice about this is there's good. nobody who is a subscriber to the new york times who is upset that one sliver of the new york times at this moment in time is available freely it's right. not like it damages our subscriptions to the new york times that they're now doing this free no uh, of course not yeah so, no you know uh, in fact but it should be right I, like the wall street journal has been making this uh information about ukraine free and outside yeah. the paywall and tweeting it as such and i don't know if the times has until now so yeah i mean that's the other option they could have just said anything tagged on the website but I, what i really think this is about is censorship resistance i think it's very easy to block newyorktimes.com right and totally. by putting it to multiple channels i would guess they're going to do this on some other platforms as well um and this is also where i think some of the social media platforms could do something good like facebook could conceivably uh, say, hey, New York Times, uh, we will pay you a penny mm -hmm. uh, as a licensing fee, or, 
you know, whatever, a dollar per thousand, uh, you know, a fraction of a penny, whatever, you know, they come up with for everybody in Europe who reads a Ukraine related story on Facebook. Yeah. So we'll give you a million dollars to license these stories for the next six months or a year on the platform. And we'll have a special section, facebook.com slash NYT Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be a nice thing if Facebook ever shot the lock off their wallet and decided to pay content creators. Although there is some rumor that Facebook has some secret covert <coughs> licensing deal with the New York Times, where they ship like 10, 20 million dollars. I've seen people talk hmm. about this relationship. I think the New York Times has even talked about it where they're getting some licensing or some money from Facebook, but I guess they don't like to talk about it all that much. Um, because they don't want it to overshadow coverage. And then there was also like, reportedly some $5 million ad buy for those ads that like Facebook thinks the new internet needs to be I don't know if you watch like the Sunday morning news programs. Did you get like, during, no. during all of those hearings? Yeah, Facebook had a series of like, wow, the internet has changed so much in the last decade. It's hard to figure out what information is. We should come up with a new rule set. And Facebook really supports a new way to think about, you know, it's like trying to influence people watching yeah. Meet the Press or Face the Nation or, you know, State of the Union kind of uh, audience. Uh, and I thought that was kind of interesting. But it was also, they bought all these podcasts off. And I remember Kara Swisher talking about it. She's like, I'm not reading that ad. So she like declined oh, because of the interesting. optics. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing to read a Casper ad or a, eight sleep ad it's another thing to be like yeah. i cover facebook and how it's and killing democracy ad. and let me read an ad i mean they Ouch. are they are aggressive about advertising i haven't seen them on the sunday news shows but they are very aggressive about advertising within news properties like they advertise on axios Market and i do yeah. hear them on a lot of podcasts yeah. were, they, were they on marketplace too or no mm, i don't think so yeah see that's the thing is people are like there's a perfect but honestly moment. i don't know well exactly so people assume the hosts like Oh, it's influencing the host. Like the totally host don't even. No in a lot of cases, the host don't even know. <laughs> like uh, sometimes we would get a note about somebody being an underwriter at Marketplace and be like, "Wait, what? Really? really? I mean, I that, in that case, I w I would say I maybe had more idea at other outlets, but certainly not public radio. No. Well, and we you're no savaging clue. them, right? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like, exactly. oh, that. Wait, didn't we just absolutely like, you know, demolish just them? Last don't week? tell me. The only time we would find out is if we did mention. Like if one producer was in charge of making sure that if we mentioned an underwriter, then we would say they're an underwriter. So sometimes you'll hear yes. NPR say that because Facebook is you have to be careful an of, underwriter. of unintended uh, collision. So in the magazine business, we used to have somebody who would look at the stories and the ads and just make sure that the story on the left did not in some way reference the story, the ad on right. the right or the page totally. before it. So that's somebody who was reading about you know, some criticism of IBM did not turn the page and get a Watson ad, or some pro story about Watson would be, you know, in the editor's letter. And then, you know, the front, the back page would be it. You'd be like, uh, we gotta, you know, the appearance of impropriety was always challenging. Yeah. Uh, not that yeah. anybody cares anymore. That was I like, I was gonna say that was the good old days. Now it's like, I mean, I remember being at CNET and it was like, yeah. you could Samsung was not allowed to run an ad on huh. a review page of a Samsung phone, for example. Yes. Now it's like, Samsung has a huge banner. like a, a web page takeover, like and then a big banner. Yes. And then you read that, you know, and it just stopped. And People the and stopped they're in the that. CNET labs and the like this giant Samsung logo brought to you. By <laughs> well, come on. <laughs> not exactly. <yes. laughs> Welcome to Gordon Ra Cooking with Gordon Ramsay, brought to you by Wheat, a Wheat <laughs> Council. If you're a startup developing new software or investing in R&D, you may be owed up to $250,000 in cash back from the government. But the R&D tax credit program is very complicated. It requires a bunch of technical and financial justifications for the IRS. And that's where Boast can help you. Boast is a platform that helps startups get cash back from the government. They integrate with over 60 different software providers, which automates document gathering. This helps Boast deliver the fastest IRS compliant R&D tax credit claim in the industry. This helps Boast deliver the fastest IRS compliant R&D tax claim in the industry. Companies like Bevy Labs and Dooley have recovered hundreds of thousands of dollars with Boast over the past few years. So what's the cost? Well, Boast only makes money 
once you've gotten your cash back. If you don't get paid, they don't get paid either. If you do, they take a modest percentage between 10 and 20%, depending on your volume. So the upside is free money from the IRS. Sounds pretty good to me. And the downside is no risk. So here's your call to action. The deadline to claim is approaching fast. So contact Bose today. The first 50 customer signups will get 10% off their first year of filing. Just mention the promo code TWIST at boast.ai slash twist. That's B-O-A-S-T dot A-I slash twist. Uh, all right, let's do this Clearview AI story because uh, that's do, always this is, fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Because when it comes to Clearview, I have questions. Clearview AI is giving Ukraine's defense ministry free access to its facial recognition search engine. And uh, evidently, Clearview is saying you could potentially use this to vet people of interest at security checkpoints to identify the dead, to reunite refugees with separated families, to identify Russian operatives and help the government take down false social media posts on war. Yeah, fascinating. We actually had the founder. No, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had the founder, Wonton Tat, on the podcast episode 1100 back in August of 2020. Mm. And uh, he demoed the product for us. There was a lot of controversy around the startup because they took publicly available pictures, made mm -hmm. their own databases. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we're giving it to law enforcement. Law enforcement would buy it so that they could, if they took a picture of a perp, somebody committed a crime, they wouldn't want to give their driver's license or something, uh, or they had somebody on a camera robbing a house uh, or a business, they could maybe find them through social media. And of course, it turns out like high correlation between criminals and, you know, usage of social media. Obviously, when they were raising money, there was this other rumor that they had given complimentary accounts to a bunch of right wing kind of folks. And uh, those folks, you would use it to take pictures of women and then reverse image look up a woman at a bar to mm. find their social media and other creepy nonsense. Uh, they raised money from Peter Thiel. Uh, and so it's part of the whole right wing privacy conundrum uh kind of group but let's it's like think this through sort of beyond that i mean yeah clearview ai yeah, i mean it's been fined at, at least once i'm looking this up it was recently fined in italy 20 million dollars oh. over privacy Whoa. concerns it's sort of like the that. or i'm sorry 20 million pounds it's like the company that has kickstarted in a lot of cities you know attempts to ban facial recognition technology mm. because it can be used so poorly in some cases and i would just be it could be abused yeah, I mean, I'm very worried. Because it's actually of, super effective, right? Like it actually, the technology now works brilliantly. I, well, well, no, it can be abused because it like can't tell the difference between, you know, one black person and another black person. Oh, okay. Like so it can be abused That's why I was trying of, to parse what you were saying. And I think it may have even been implicated. That's what I was trying to find. I think it might have been implicated in a very specific hmm. false recognition case, but I, I got to look that up. Um, I mean, it's going to be, I yeah. think, look, introducing a tool like this, which is has been under all kinds of fire and and brought a ton of controversy into a war zone mm. to me feels like not a good idea yeah so the question is yeah i mean in all these cases what is it being used for right if it was being used to take a picture of a dead soldier tragically to inform the family you know possibly that we may have identified your missing child or uh, there's a missing young person uh, who got separated from their parents and they're not dead, but they're on the border of Poland and you want to find their parents. Like, so the abuse is always the issue with these. And that was one of the things I drilled down with the founder on. And I found his answers were um, kind of hit or miss. Because I was like, is there a tracking system? It's like, absolutely, there's a tracking audit system. I'm like, great. So you have like the records of everybody who used it. So if somebody was using it to stalk their ex or stalk somebody or do some nefarious thing, you would know he's like well no that's the job of the local police department they have the audit logs i'm like mm -hmm. so the local police who would abuse it also have the audit logs like shouldn't you have a backup auto log say well that's their decision like and that's sort of like uh you know and they're like well they could put you know their mayor in charge of the audit log or their you know ethics department you know in san francisco in charge of the audit logs the da whoever and when the police use it or a detective uses it, it would be logged, but they didn't have their own clarity on that. I felt it could have been like they could have been more proactively scanning for abuse. But, you know, I'm sure they've gotten a lot of feedback on it. 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think it was implicated in that very specific false positive case that I was thinking about, although New Jersey hmm. banned it over after some false positives it's just like a, i don't know it just is sort of this larger question of like is that what is that what is necessary right now yeah uh, you know i the way i look at these tools is with massive controls and a warrant so i think the problem with this tool is if you give the frontline people whether it's police or soldiers access to do it the chances of abuse are almost certain Right. Chances of false positive, you know, that's happens with witnesses, right? Like a witness can give you a false positive. Uh, you know, they look at those books of mugshots, classically, as in every police drama episode. So therefore, if this was something where a judge could say, Oh, you want to take this pictures of the person who was murdered on the BART, you have two suspects, run it through Clearview, you get your list of potential perps, then you have some delicate way of making sure that you're not knocking down the door and getting in a firefight with people where you're just, you know, deftly figuring out could they possibly have been in the area during that time. That would be my easy solution for this is to make it a warrant. Like I think facial recognition to use that should just be something people have to file a warrant for. A judge looks at it, just like a wiretap, reasonable not. What do you think of my solution? Um, yeah, I agree. I, I just think, and then as a result, because there's going to be time involved no matter what, then I don't know if I see there being a significant difference between that system, so to speak, and using AI. You know, like, they're going to photograph soldiers, they're going to have a database, like, I don't know that this is additive. And if anything, it feels like it could increase the chance of like, um, people are pointing out in the chat, misidentifying somebody at a border checkpoint and getting them shot. Yeah, like, I mean, that's the don't, yeah, that you know, like, if you don't know, <laughs> that it's perfect yes don't introduce it in a battlefield situation i just sort of yeah. feel like that's not this does not feel like it has the potential to help as much as it could hurt that is i think well said you with this new technology you're going to have to know is this like nine nine five nines or 98 percent and there's a one in 50 chance of misidentifying somebody with this technology right if it was during an investigation of a robbery, well, there's probably a little downside. But if it's in a battlefield or a cop is pulling somebody over at a traffic stop and it misidentifies somebody as like a felon who's you know got a history of like gun trafficking, like okay, now you've got six cop cars surrounding somebody who's misidentified, yeah. and the chances of a tragedy here's, occurring is here like here is the story too. Thank you, Serge Dog, for pulling up the story um, in the New York Times about this New Jersey man. This did cause them to to block it. Where Clearview misidentified this guy uh huh. and police arrested him a black man of course because this is where so many of these identification issues tend to come up is people of color the um police identified him using clearview software and accused him arrested him accusing him of shoplifting candy and trying to hit a police officer with a car hmm. totally not him like was not him and he was the third person known to be falsely arrested based on bad facial recognition data yeah, it, it does seem like these technologies are using they data sets. They inferred that yeah. Clearview was, they inferred. They were, they're not 100% sure. They know that the New Jersey Police Department was using Clearview AI, oh, okay. and then he was falsely identified by so that software. Possible so or probable. I should be very specific about, yes. yes, exactly, the legal implications here. Yes. It was anyway, possible all I'm saying is, I don't think that's good enough to use on the battlefield. That doesn't seem additive to me. That seems like, uh, attempting to insert yourself into a situation where the the benefits are dubious and the harms are large. Yeah, and, and this technology will also be able to clear people in some instances. And in some instances, it's like the DNA stuff. Like anytime this new technology comes out, when the DNA stuff came out, it wasn't accurate enough. And then it wound up exonerating a bunch of people 10 years later. So there is definitely some cleared eyed uh, application issues here. You got to go into this with very good intent. And you're going to have to be reserving judgment and using it maybe as a way to steer you to possibilities of suspects or clearing people's names, but it's it's not fully ready for prime time. What is your general thought? I'm, I've never had we never had this conversation. What's your general thought on cameras in cities? The UK packed with yeah. cameras, China obviously packed with cameras. So you have authoritarian and democracies, both deploying this for safety. And then you have I think San Francisco, and Oakland have filed to preemptively ban like citywide camera systems, or maybe the yeah. storing of data. What's your you have a feeling on it? I'm curious. 
I mean, surveillance is super problematic. Like it's a society problem. Like I remember when Google Glass early on had to get rid of facial recognition. Like I was one of the people when Google Glass first came out and I was like, oh my God, that would be so awesome if I had a contact lens or glasses where I could just look at somebody and it would recognize their face and it would give me their like current stats, you know, like what's their last tweet? Like superhuman does. What are their last couple of tweets and what's their calendar? And you know, what's their sort of publicly available social information? Like that would be so useful to go up and down the street and get this real time stream of data about people. And then that was my own naivete, naivete in a way about how good that technology could be and whether people have a right to privacy. Like if people have a right to privacy, you can't put cameras all over and you can't put them in glasses and you can't, you know, try to identify someone's face and maybe get it wrong and get them yeah. like canceled on the street because of, you know, a, a, mis a misattributed tweet. Like it just is ultimately always going to be a problem. And yet we've opted into so much surveillance that I'm not sure it's a problem we can even stop at this point. If that Let's makes get some, sense. Some notes about Singapore. Uh, yeah, Singapore they plan is like to double the number of police cameras to more than 200,000 over the next decade. They currently have 90,000 cameras in 270 square miles, which is 330 police cameras per square mile, according to Reuters. That's bonkers. That's you know, there bonkers. is. I. I, have I guess the real question is like, would you rather have police watching you or would you rather have ring? Would you rather have like Google and or, you know, and a company yeah, yeah. Citizens, surveilling you yeah. or governments? I think the cat's out of the bag. People have the right to put cameras in and around their homes. That seems reasonable. Therefore, there will be cameras in most places. So and then police will just get that. Police will have access to it through yeah. uh, just asking for it. I mean, citizens can give as there is their right to give over the police give to the police somebody who runs through their backyard. A friend of mine had somebody run through their backyard while robbing their neighbor last week. Um, and then I had somebody last night and both in LA, both in the same area of LA, West Hollywood, and mm -hmm. they both live like up hills and stuff like that. So one had some my friend last night had somebody just walk up to his glass door and start knocking on the door as a deranged um, person. And uh, then the other person had somebody run through the backyard, both caught on cameras. Uh, so I don't know if the deterrent thing is working with people who are Right. I mean, I'm not sure. It doesn't. <laughs> I think I mean, it, it works for work. criminals. It doesn't work for people who are high uh, or mentally ill. Yeah. They're just like, oh, a camera, who cares? <laughs> I'm like high out of my mind or I'm or I'm mentally ill or I'm suffering from both tragically. Well, and the police don't always come. And frankly, there are situations when I don't want the police to come because I don't want someone to get shot because they're mentally ill or on drugs. Like, that's that is a, a challenge. Yeah. I mean, that's a real conversation in Oakland about when is it even morally acceptable to call the police because you don't want to get somebody killed. Because they can't get the right services. Yeah. If it's a mentally ill person, and then you're now in this weird situation where you're feeling empathy for a person who's mentally ill, and then you have to protect your family. Right. And they're on your property. Yeah. It right. Is, uh, they're just so don't anyway, answers here. I, I think yeah. it's like, it's one of these questions where like, no, I don't like it. And I do not believe for a second that, you know, does privacy matter if you have nothing to lose is that or nothing to hide is a reasonable approach. Because first of all, anybody if you could do enough digging has something to hide and misidentification and misattribution are real. And my favorite word, and cameras awesome. are freaking everywhere. Like we might have already lost this battle. Yeah, I think the battle's lost. The question is, who should have the keys to the kingdom? I, th I like that 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 is the actual question. Should cities just opt out of doing it? I right. think there's something even more reasonable here, which is kind of like COVID policy. I always felt like when things become more acute, like the hospitals fill up, you know, and there's no ICU beds, like yeah. maybe you have a different policy than when the hospitals are empty. And you know, like you could have a different strategy depending mm -hmm. on the weather forecast. So if you were in the San Francisco at this moment in time, the tenderloin, whatever places where there's a lot of guns and murder or, you know, New York in the 70s or 80s, you have a lot of cameras. And then, you know, if you um, live in a place where there's not a lot of crime, and you need to have a few, you know, just have a few. It's time for another R Crowd deal of the week. Right now, you can join R Crowd's investment in DID. And according to their deal memo, DID has patented reenactment technology. And their tech uses AI and deep learning to turn still photos into videos. DID does this for Fortune 500 companies, and they also have multi million dollar deals with movie studios, social media companies, and online genealogy platforms, according to their deal memo. 
So you can invest in DID at rcrowd.com slash twist today. All over the world, companies like DID are innovating and driving returns for investors, and our crowd analyzes many of these companies. Then they select the ones with the greatest growth potential and bring them to you. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to the $50 billion video and synthetic media industry. Our crowd identifies innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest, and that's early. So if you're an accredited investor, you can join our crowd for free at OURCROWD.com slash twist and review their current deals. That's OURCROWD.com slash twist to sign up for free. I, I have tons of cameras and I everywhere. Just, you know, <laughs> I would just commute to where there's no cameras and do my crime there. Uh, or, you know, there are some places where, you know, there just might be less cameras. I, I, we also had the person who has the software for license plate identifying. And that one is also particularly interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. there is an open source project. I don't know if you know about this, Molly, that somebody made, uh, Flock, Flock Safety is the name of the company, which I wanted to invest in. Your community can set up a couple of cameras on like the major arteries. It keeps 60, I think 30 days by default or 60 days of license plates. Crime happens. You look at, here are the license plates that have been in this neighborhood, you know, five times or more. In other words, the people who live there, or, you know, 20 times or more. Here are the license plates that are not. Let's start looking through those license plates and see if we can find people who maybe drove through the neighborhood or were on the block where the crime occurred. And if people are driving in to do crimes, pretty quick way to catch somebody. Yeah. Uh, and it's just data. And they specifically don't take uh, photos of the car. All they know is the license plate. Hmm. So they have built the technology to scan the license plate, OCR it, you don't actually get a picture. And I was like, well, shouldn't you get the picture of the video of and encrypt it of the this way, you know, if somebody stole the car, or if they were in the car, that'd be great evidence it's like, yeah, but then people would know who's going to what person's house, who's driving which car, you know, like all the privacy concerns come up. So huh. Yeah, you could be thoughtful about this as the CEO of the company, If the right. CEO of the company says we're never going to take the windshield picture, we're just going to take the license plate. That's enough data. It's kind of like the metadata of phone calls without recording the phone call, right? I will say though, that's, a, that's yes. But and? don't people steal license plates all the time? Well, yeah. So of then if you don't even match the license plate to the car, then you just go arrest some poor person who had their license they might plate have, stolen. I wonder if they, I'm trying I to remember the conversation. Think, I think there might, it was episode 1249. So somebody can watch it. But I mean, these uh, are all, yeah, these are just all after the fact bolt-ons for crime, which is ultimately a social problem, right? Like, I just don't think, you don't stop crime with surveillance. You just don't. Like, you maybe catch criminals. Well, maybe. you may stop them. You may catch them before they do the next one. <laughs> you may catch them before you do the next one, but yeah. they're not, they're, you know, they're being framed as this kind of like this thing that we have to have to stop crime. And, and I fundamentally do not believe that's what they do. You know, for some period of time, cameras were dissuading crime. There w that was proven that the presence of a camera would lower crime because people were putting even decoy cameras out. So if you when cameras were very expensive, they would put one real one and then just put the casings for 10 other ones around. But I don't know if that's still the case now. Yeah, I don't and think it, so. It might be that the true hardcore criminals, they don't care if they're on camera, right? Like, and the people who might have, you know, done opportunistic crime, I'm thinking like somebody who might have stolen a newspaper or something petty, might have done it like opportunistically but they saw a camera, they didn't. But if you're in a gang and like, that's one of the things about what's happening in San Francisco with the Walgreens and stuff like that. The feds came in and actually busted a giant crime ring, like the DOJ came in and it turned out it was like a super coordinated crime ring mm -hmm. that was sending people in who were addicts. So it was like people addicted to drugs going in. And when they would come out with their bag of stuff, they would just give them a dollar per item. Mm -hmm. And they're like, here's the top 10 list. If you get any of these, you get $2 per item. They would ship those items to, I think it was Oakland uh, or Alameda. They had a warehouse. They busted the warehouse and they were driving the stuff down to Los Angeles and San Diego. And they would just go to stores and say, you want any of these items for $4 each? And so somebody would buy, you know, razors or shampoo or condoms or whatever is a high ticket item. And they would give it to them for cash. And it was like a, it was literally a gang thing. So this idea yeah. that it was you know, not coordinated was false. It was right. specifically a coordinated, specific process. Because you're like, why is the person going in there and stealing 20 cans of one thing? Like, they must have a fence somewhere to to move this stuff. This is a big story. Um, and, a, and just a big sort of an additional canary in the coal mine, I think. Companies are now facing more production issues due to chip back orders caused by the Ukraine-Russia conflict. 
But also that lockdowns in China, even just over the weekend, got massive. So China has a Mm. bunch more COVID lockdowns. And uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, that is impacting all kinds of raw materials. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are causing shortages in in neon and palladium specifically. And then evidently the auto industry has been hit the hardest. Specific automakers are being impacted. Ford is going to sell and deliver some explorers with limited features, including um, no rear heating and some missing air conditioning controls. GM is no longer offering wireless charging, HD radios, and a fuel management mobile module that made some pickup trucks operate more efficiently. Tesla sold cars without USB ports. I can tell you that the Polestar that I just got is missing the sensor where you can put your foot under the trunk, you know, oh, how you really? can, like, swipe your foot under and have it like oh. auto open. And basically they're like, it's kind of a crapshoot at this point, whether your car has it or not. Cause it's all about whether this hmm. one part came in from China. Will and they once put it, gets it in here, post? Like, yeah, they'll put it in later. Ah, cool. Yeah. But Bloomberg is reporting. This is the big, this is where the, the China COVID lockdowns are just like becoming a massive double whammy here. Bloomberg reported that Foxconn, which of course produces iPhones has multiple factories in Shenzhen, has been forced to pause operations in Shenzhen after the Chinese government imposed mandatory lockdowns due to a rise in COVID cases. I wonder if it's Omicron there or what the Chinese know that we don't because we're going, it seems like the rest of the world is just, we're going to go through the eye of the storm. Or is it that they don't have the vaccines there? Because they had a zero COVID policy and I guess they can shut things down and they have cheap testing, I understand, $2 or something a person so they can test an entire city very quickly. Uh, I called a friend freaking out about this because I was uh, just like, I can't go back. (laughs) But but she made the really interesting point. We're like prisoners who are like, you're going to have to take me. I'm not, you're going to have to take me dead. I'm fighting to the end. I'm not going back to jail. I'm not going to do it. it. I'm not going back. (laughs) But she made the interesting point. um, And I hope that this is the case that yes, because China did have sort of a zero COVID policy for a long time, that there isn't actually broad-based immunity and we may say that we had a lot of like lockdowns in the u.s but in fact we did that was very regional we had very spotty uptake of even basic intervention like masking um and so and our vaccines are a lot better Mm. and there's much more access to boosters and so it does seem to be that china is still vulnerable to these big outbreaks whether it's omicron or ba2 um i think i even read there's like a delta cron (laughs) <laughs> it's all happening now. Yes. Um, I don't hope that is the case in the case of China, because if they're still that vulnerable, a lot of people are going to die. What it, li- it likely suggests is that BA2 is not going to sweep through the United States, for example, and like cause no, it's another not. wave the way that Omicron did. I was reading up on this this weekend because we had a little COVID outbreak at our house. Uh, so mm-hmm. it feels like everybody's going to get it at some point. Everybody's fine. Uh, but uh, it is definitely, you know, it's it's pretty obvious we have some sort of hurt, dare I say, hurt immunity um, uh, or resiliency. Greater. We have the, broader immunity, you know. Is that the is that the term I'm allowed to use? Broader immunity? I mean, you're allowed to say whatever you want. Got it. Okay. Herd immunity, censored. I think, does refer to a specific benchmark that we have not hit, but we Got do it. have more immunity. Like, just yes. broadly, you know, more people have gotten it and or have gotten what are said to be higher quality vaccines. Huh. And, you know, we don't have a we don't have a great booster rate, but the vaccines overall are good. And a lot of people got it in the United States. I mean, this is the problem when you don't have it spread in your population, I guess you Mm -hmm. are still a target for it. And so I guess the Chinese government is going to go with shut everything down for 10 days and then test everybody, which we could have had that option, too. We just never got testing. We had like two companies doing testing. And even now. These Binance tests, or what is it? What are they called? I think, excuse me, I think Binance is the um, cryptocurrency <laughs> exchange. Binance is the Binax. Binax. Is the at home. Uh, Binax. Antigen tests. N-A-X, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Binax uh, kits are, uh, I think they're now $10 per test, 20 bucks for two. And in other places in the world, it's two to $5 a test. So we're yeah. still well, only have one like- or two providers and these other places have 70 different tests including ones that i think you just swab your mouth and you're done yep. so what a disaster but hopefully this does not create massive supply chains not because we need to open our trunks with our feet as cool a feature that is i just think on the economy front it would be really tragic that the reopening doesn't happen and we move into 
you know, goods and services uh, not flowing and then companies going out of business and then jobs going away. Yeah. It's very hard to understand what's going on because there's now 11.6 million job openings, 5 million people looking for jobs. So somewhere or 6 million, you know, these numbers are not perfect, but basically there's five, 6 million extra jobs in the United States right now. Uh, So, and And, record savings. And this will be destroyed. I mean, look, if there's a pandemic anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. I guess that's the, that's the, (laughs) what the word means is that it's everywhere. So if there are outbreaks anywhere, there are effectively outbreaks everywhere. Like, unless there's, it could impact us. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. Uh, Yeah. We're all connected. One of the things I think is a silver lining here is on consumption, you know, this backlog of cars being available, everybody drives their car for another year. I guess that's arguably good for the environment that we're not absolutely consuming as much. Uh, And that's actually one of the approaches I've taken in my life. Like I decided I wasn't going to order anything on Amazon for 30 days. Because I was like, I just have all this stuff I ordered. And I have this very like heavy Amazon finger where I just click (laughs) too hard too often. And I think I'm just taking a 30 day break. Just balls. Yeah, I just keep clicking. And, um, you know, now uh, it's been nice to not have any packages coming for me, at least because the opening of the packages and I mean, this is the modern era of abundance. Mm -hmm. I think it's nice to like buy things. I told you the other thing I'm doing is buying things once for the rest of my life. So my Crockett and Jones shoes, my Danner boots, my skillet my giant crock pot from La Crusade. I don't know what they call mm-hmm. those. Dutch oven. The Dutch oven. Like I'm looking at all these things at 50 and I'm just saying last Dutch oven I ever buy, last pair of boots I ever buy, last ski jacket I buy. I want to get one that lasts 10 years or 20 years. I just want to yeah. buy like the best thing, the most durable, most sustainable and start looking at life that way as opposed to this constant disposable culture of everything. Yep. I'm with you. And people bought a lot of crap during the pandemic, which is partly why I mean, you know, we keep talking about the supply chain backup and the this and that. And at least what you know, one of the major factors here was not just that supply chains were screwed up. It's that Americans bought a crap ton of crap. Everybody bought a bicycle. Everybody was like, I want to buy a new car. Everybody's like, I want to buy I want to start taking tennis lessons, a guitar, everything. Yeah. So there you have it. All right. There you have it. All right, we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Producer Nick here. I want to tell you about the SaaS Syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product and market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to thesyndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, to apply to raise from the SaaS Syndicate. And you can join Jason's syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at thesyndicate.com. Producer Justin here. No cool startup? Check out OpenScouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 10% of our carry. Hey, everybody. Producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at remotedemoday.com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university slash charity.